<laughs> Temporary uh, Wi-Fi malfunction. Sorry, I just switched to a different network. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to go through everything again because my audio was working. Okay. So. okay. Um, hi, I'm C. Derek Varn. I am an editor and author at Zero Books, um, and my specialties are actually more economic history than economics proper, um, although my academic background is more in anthropology and in English and instruction. So, you know, we're eclectic here. Um, I am not a professional economist, do not claim to be a professional economist, and I want that known to be out on the outset. I want to admit um, some limitations in this. However, um, I also want to grant that we are not going to be debating the what what we would consider the central claim of MMT, which is that currency um, is is in. neoclassical axioms for a long time um, and even more seriously avoided by Austrian ones. Um, so I think I, I think that one of the reasons I agreed to do this debate was because I think that we have to deal with all the implications of MMT, particularly when we talk about something as nebulous as a post-capitalist society. I suspect that Sam and I disagree on what post-capitalism actually is. We might even disagree about what capitalism is. Um, and, um, but we need to tease these out in a mildly oppositional manner, I think. Um, and I wanna encourage everybody, um, regardless of who you side with today to really dig into and try to deal with the questions MMT raises because it is important. All right, I'm Sam Kangerloo. My academic background is also very multidisciplinary like Derek's. Uh, mostly in the social sciences, history, sociology, government, and philosophy, and finding synthesis between them. I'm a subject matter expert on modern monetary theory who corresponds with a number of MMT economists and with whom I have relationships where I pose challenges, questions, and where we workshop various ideas connected to MMT. In particular, I've kept up a semi-regular correspondence with MMT pioneer uh, Warren Mosler. And very recently, I've actually turned Dr. Cornell West onto MMT. I'm also involved with several MMT advocacy groups and organizations, including the organization Real Progressives, run by its founder, Stephen Grumbine. I engage with parliamentary politics as a progressive, and in that capacity, I've work to support and advocate and volunteer for progressive political uh, campaigns here in the United States, most recently for the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign, and prior to that for a number of proto-Bernie presidential campaigns in various capacities, including policy advocacy. Um, that's included the Dennis Kucinich for president, uh, president campaign and twice for Ralph Nader. Um, now, that being said, the underlying political philosophy or ideology to which I subscribe is libertarian socialism, which 
as many in your audience, which as many in your audience will know, is just a polite term for anarchism, right? So my advocacy for progressive politics, the anarchist principles to which I adhere, and my understanding of MMT form a synthesis that I think offers a cohesive and practically, uh, pragmatically and practically actionable way to alleviate as much suffering as possible as quickly as possible under our world's current socioeconomic reality while simultaneously moving us toward a post-capitalist world um, before humanity finds itself in a situation where ecological and socioeconomic breakdown reach a point of no return. Um, the most immediate source of that threat, I think, is clearly neoliberal capitalism and the austerity policies which it advances and supports. Uh, austerity policies that are not only entirely economically unnecessary, but that, and this cannot be overstated, directly and indirectly, more than any other cause, um, lead to more worldwide death and destruction, um, all of which are unnecessary um, and have led to the rise of folks like Donald Trump throughout the world. Thank you. Great. Let's get started. Okay, so the first and foremost, what people need to understand and is often misunderstood about MMT is it's not something that is done. Okay, it's not something you do. It's not something a government does. It is a thoroughly empirical project. Therefore, it is descriptive, not prescriptive. That makes it something that can be grafted onto literally any number of political ideologies and orientations from liberalism to conservatism, progressivism to Trumpism, fascism to socialism, any other one you can think of. Um, and just to quote preeminent MMT scholar and economist Bill Mitchell, quote, MMT is not a regime that you apply or switch to or introduce. Rather, MMT is a lens which allows us to see the true intrinsic workings of the fiat monetary system. It helps us better understand the choices available to a currency issuing government it is not a regime, but an accurate perspective on reality. And I completely concur with that. So what are the central insights or revealed truths that MMT demonstrates to be the case? So here, I'm just gonna give some high level MMT fundamentals. And then over the course of the debate and discussion, um, I'll go into greater detail on these fundamentals as needed as they come up, right? So first and foremost, as Derek alluded to, is the idea that money is a creature of the state or some other issuing authority, okay? Money was not born of barter, nor does it represent barter, as we've all been raised to think, and that so many economists get wrong. Even Karl Marx got that one wrong. The barter story of money is a myth. And this realization about what money actually is and how it functions is known, as Derek said, uh, as chartalism. And it's been corroborated by anthropologists the world over long before MMT ever came to fruition back in 1996. The most notable anthropologist to corroborate this MMT claim is probably the very recently deceased David Graeber, who was an anarchist and who in his book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years, proves exactly this claim about the origins of money and what it is and how it functions. Um, but as I said, he's not the first or the only anthropologist to prove this. So what is money then, okay? Three central things here. It is a social unit of account. It is a promise to pay, therefore it's an IOU. And the third, it's a tax credit, which I realize is not self-explanatory, but again, that's one that we can flesh out as it comes up, um, if it comes up during the debate. Second fundamental insight, and Derek alluded to this as well, a country that is fully monetarily sovereign does not finance federal spending with tax dollars. And this cannot be emphasized enough by MMT. What that means is that the government does not actually tax in order to spend, nor does it actually borrow in order to spend, meaning bonds do not function to finance government spending. Monetarily sovereign nations spend money into existence through their federal legislative bodies. That means as issuers of a currency that they have complete control over, they spend first and when they tax, those tax dollars are actually deleted from the economy. 
So your federal tax dollars do not pay for any federal spending whatsoever. That includes your payroll taxes, Medicare and Social Security. And uh, that bit was actually well understood by the uh, Roosevelt administration, by the FDR's administration when they introduced the Social Security program. And look, I realize that all of that begs a lot of questions like, what about all the money I keep hearing we owe the Chinese? But again, we can cover that in detail and depth during the debate as needed. Um, I do think it's important now to define what the heck a fully monetarily sovereign nation is. Um, and so a fully, monetary, a fully monetary sovereign nation is one that meets four criteria, okay? One, it issues its own currency. Two, it taxes in its own currency. Three, it must not be taxing its, its population in any currency other than its own. And four, it lets its currency float, which simply means that its currency isn't pegged to anything like gold or silver or to the currency of another country, okay? Examples of countries that are fully monetary sovereign, uh, fully monetarily sovereign include the United States, Canada, the UK, Japan, Australia, Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, New Zealand, Iceland, and many others. So for uh, those who may have noticed, um, I haven't mentioned a single country that's on the Euro, and there's a good reason for that, which we can tackle during the debate segment as well. Um, all of that does not, however, mean that the government can just spend without constraint, okay? There is a constraint. It's just not tax dollars, since tax dollars don't actually fund federal spending. The constraint is real resource availability. When the spending in an economy, otherwise known as aggregate demand in econ speak, outstrips the amount of goods and services that are actually being produced, and there aren't enough available resources, meaning land, labor, and machinery, to meet that increased spending, to meet that increased demand, you get inflationary pressure, which can lead to actual inflation. Too much inflation and you get a general rise in prices that can severely hamper the value of people's money as prices rise and the value of the currency falls. And that degrades the ability of people to meet their material needs, okay? Uh, that's known as demand pull inflation. There's also cost push inflation and sectoral inflation pressures, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. Again, that's something we can tackle during the back and forth segment. But all of that suggests correctly a number of things, including that inflation is actually really not that easy to generate in an, in an economy that has full monetary sovereignty, okay? And everything I've mentioned in this second insight means that governments do not and should not function like households. You and I have to balance our budget or we have to borrow. This is not the case for governments, nor should it be, okay? Um, lest they otherwise create the pressures for an otherwise unnecessary economic crisis. Third thing, third fundamental insight, sectoral balances. By virtue of the public sector, therefore the government, spending money into existence, into the economy, the government's yearly budget deficits are the economy's yearly surpluses. And the government's national debt, which by definition is the sum total of all budget deficits and surpluses that government has ever run, the national debt is the national savings of the private sector. So the national debt is not really debt at all. And to quote, pay it off would literally mean that there would be no money in the economy, okay? That's another point that anthropologists, including Graeber, have recognized from as a result of research in their own discipline. And it's totally congruent with MMT. The government, sector, the government sector's account balance equals the sum of the non-government sector, namely, the private sector and foreign sector to the penny. So I, I give, I'm gonna make that concrete with this very simple example. The United States has a so-called national debt of roughly $20 trillion, okay? That's $20 trillion the government of the United States has spent into existence since the inception of the country. So since 1786, right? Then when you examine how many dollars are held in the domestic private economy, households and firms, you see that it's roughly 19.83 trillion. The remaining 170 billion is held by foreign entities, 
That's our trade deficit, okay? The numbers, negative 20 trillion for the federal government, right? That's how much they're quote unquote in debt and plus 20 trillion for the private and foreign sectors combined, sum to zero. So these are accounting identities, right? In other words, these are nothing more than empirically true accounting identities. Um, it's why when MMTers explain MMT to certified public accountants, uh, those folks tend to get it much quicker than most of the general public. I've heard so many CPAs say to me, oh, yeah, what you're describing are just accounting identities. That's double entry accounting, mm -hmm. and that's correct. That's what the central banks of the world use to keep score of their economies, all right? Central banks like the Federal Reserve are literally scorekeepers of the economy. They neither have nor do not have dollars or pounds or yen or what have you, okay? The money is created out of thin air by legislative decree. And that is what's meant when you hear the term fiat currency, okay? And the central bank's job in that respect is simply to type those dollars into existence, which by the way, is how it happens. It's not the printing of money. These days, it's literally the keyboarding of the currency into existence via computers at the central bank for us in the private sector to use. And in the days that preceded information technology, these operations were tracked by paper ledger, okay? Mm -hmm. Fourth thing, banking. The common perception is that deposits create loans. That when you make a deposit at a bank, the deposit that you make into your checking account, okay, are then used by that bank for lending. MMT demonstrates that this is not true. Loans actually create deposits. Private banks, like the ones where we all keep our money, right? They create money out of thin air every time they lend, all right? And they too literally keystroke those dollars into existence. In this case, into your checking account, right? You take a loan and the bank deposits those loan dollars into your checking account. That loan created the deposit. So the money multiplier story is not borne out by reality. And it's yet another example of how mainstream economists have tried to fit the available data to their pre-existing models instead of creating models that actually fit the available data, okay? So last fundamental tenet is unemployment. Unemployment is never an economic inevitability, okay? It's never an economic, quote unquote, necessity. It's always a political choice. The government can buy, the central authority of the government can buy as much labor as it wants. And the federal jobs guarantee, which I'm sure many of your audience have heard about, is the only thing intrinsic to MMT that comes close to being prescriptive. And that's because MMT notices that a federal jobs guarantee can simultaneously solve the problem of unemployment while maintaining price stability, therefore avoiding inflation, okay? So it's intrinsic to MMT for those reasons and because also it's counter cyclical, which just means simply that it contracts and expands with the business cycle. And I'm happy to chat more about that later on as well. So to sum up, taking all of that into account, Whenever you hear someone, whether it be uh, your uncle or your friend, or especially some lawmaker or policymaker in Washington say, how are you gonna pay for that? Whenever single payer healthcare or a green new deal or a living wage, a federal jobs guarantee, or even tax cuts, et cetera, et cetera, depending on your politics are brought up, the answer should always be, quote, literally, the same way we've always been paying for all government spending since FDR took us off the domestic gold standard in 1934. Congress passes legislation and then, and the treasury spends the money by instructing the Federal Reserve to mark up the relevant bank accounts. The money is simply always spent into existence. And so long as there are enough goods and services being produced or able to be produced, to meet whatever increased demand those new federally injected dollars might generate, we can afford it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with a series of questions, some of which are gonna get into some things that I, I find interesting that is bracketed out of the empirical considerations of MMT. Now, notice that I am not contesting almost anything that Sam says, because 
he's right. In many ways, they're uncontestable. Um, but I, I do have a couple of, of considerations that I want to talk about. When we, when we talk about economic sovereignty, um, we talk about trade in terms of states. So do you owe states, if the state taxes in another currency, if it owes debts significantly in another currency? Um, that, that most of the third world, for example, is automatically um, eradicated from current MNT considerations. We're not talking about possibilities here um, because they owe debts in either USD or euros. Um, and we also didn't mention, um, if, if somebody noticed in the list of currency sovereigns, we did not mention China and we can talk about why for a second, but China's currency is not actually free floating. Um, and so it, it cannot be considered a, uh, a currency sovereign. There are reasons for that. Um, reasons for that that some of the considerations of MMT confuses me on how they explain, but we'll get we'll get into that in the, later in the debate as well. Um, but I am interested in the fact that private trade and and currency sovereignty is not addressed in the definition. Um, Sam, why is that? Could you explain to me what you mean by private trade? So trade between firms. So international trade that is demarcated oh, yeah. in a currency other than the currency of the nation at hand yep. um, between internet uh, firms internationally. Yep. So when that happens, that actually is a part of current account balances. That's part of a trade deficit. So when firms, for example, a firm in China and a firm in the United States trade, that gets added into your current into that country's current account balance the sum difference between exports and imports. So it's taken into account in the sectoral balances explanation I gave. And in the case of the United States, when you have a trade deficit, okay, that money that you spent on real goods and services that you imported had to come from somewhere, right? The Chinese don't have a printing press. They don't have a central bank that keystrokes US dollars into existence, right? So we are giving that we are giving them that money for real goods and services mm -hmm. and that money plus the domestic private economy in the United States combined sum to zero with the U.S.'s so-called national debt. And what's important to keep in mind here, and I alluded to, and I'm glad you brought it up, is this fear about like all this money that we owe the Chinese. Here's what happens operationally. It's actually pretty simple. So we have this trade deficit with the Chinese. This money is held at the Federal Reserve Bank in what are called reserve accounts, which is just fancy econ speak for a checking account at the central bank, at the Federal Reserve in the case of the United States, okay? And so what happens is the Chinese would prefer to earn a rate of return, some interest on this money that they have in their reserve account. And so what they do is they ask or they tell, because it's an option, the Federal Reserve to move that money from their checking account at the Fed to their savings account, which is what's known as a treasury account. So all of these bonds that we owe the Chinese is literally just moving money from one pocket of the Federal Reserve to the other, moving their money from their checking account to their savings account. There's no problem. If the Chinese tomorrow say, we want all our money, we literally keystroke that money back from their savings account, AKA their treasury account, which is also sometimes called a securities account. All three of those terms are synonymous. They're all the same thing. And then back into their reserve or checking account. Now, why is it in the, in the Chinese interest to do that? Why is it in their interest to do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's interesting because they're the ones taking all the risk. The way, what we constantly hear like in the cultural milieu and the socio-political milieu about this is that like, oh my God, we're taking all this risk by, um, you know, having to import all these real goods from China and building up all of this quote, you know, debt, which is not actually, it's, we're just moving it from one, from one hand to the other in their account. Um, it's never an obligation that we can't meet. So who's taking the real risk here? China is trading real goods and services for numbers on a spreadsheet at the Federal Reserve. I don't say that hyperbolically, literally. Now, why would they do that, right? Mm -hmm. Because they want US dollars, 
right? They want US dollars. The US dollar is the reserve currency of the world. And they want to be able to have their an economy that relies on a trade surplus. All right. And and they rely on a trade surplus. Why? Well, because they don't have the internal infrastructure to develop everything that they need. They still require a certain degree of Here's the thing. You have a very large population, billions of people, right? Mm -hmm. And you're producing goods and services that not everyone within China as a nation is going to be able to consume, right? And mm -hmm. if, if they were to produce all of these things and try to sell them within their own markets, it would create deflationary pressure. Well, the rest of the world has created a demand for Chinese good, goods because of the cost of labor, right? The cost mm -hmm. of labor in China is cheap. And so cheap goods and services are exported to the rest of the world. And the Chinese are able to collect US dollars, which is a valuable currency that they can use to build their own infrastructure. And in and fact, as you alluded to earlier, the Chinese currency is pegged to the US dollar currently. But it will be, they'll be off the U.S. dollar within probably five years. It is it is becoming increasingly separate. I mean, they yeah. they have a basket of com uh, of reserves and commodities that they are tying their currency to, and eventually it will probably tie it to nothing, and it'll be truly fiat. Uh, yeah. Agreed. Um, so there's a couple of things that I find interesting about that. Again, in the bracketing out, and that is the power relationships that led to the situation. Yeah. Um, and MMT, MMT's description, I have actually gone through, uh, you, you asked me to read uh, Warren Muslow's Seven Deadly in, uh, Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy. Um, and then I've also read on my own, Ray and uh, Bell Keaton, and, um, and also some MMT adjacent people such as uh, Steve Keenan and um, Marvin Minsky who are close-ish to MMT, but yeah, disagree absolutely. on the bond assertion issue. But anyway, um, one of the things that I, I find interesting about that is all of the examples of the creation uh, of currency involve, um, they do not necessarily all involve what we would call a modern state, but they do all involve right. a power relationship. That's right, yeah. And a power relationship that is dependent on a near monopoly or an actual monopoly on force, correct? 100%, yep. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and... The currency is also, in classical economic terms, um, so actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to betray my bias in Marxist terms. It is, it is a substitute of a kind of, of, of a series of transactions that ultimately relate that to relations. Yes. Yes. All right. And we also agree that the limit of, a, of an economy has nothing to do with currency. It has to do with what, in classical economics, and we're not going to do any of classical economics because I think it's not worth even considering in a lot of ways. Um, what classical economics calls wealth as opposed to, you know, value. And I realize that this is a distinction between MMT and Marxism. Um, but that wealth is what we're actually at hand wealth is the physical commodities, actually not even physical commodities, the physical things that we can use, the, the um, holdings of relations that can produce those things that's also part of wealth like like when the the technologies that make it and skills and general intellect that make us able to produce more and more things is a big part of wealth so there is a power imbalance represented in most in most monetary systems correct yes absolutely i mean yes there is and those are political questions and we have to ask ourselves what are some of the intrinsic or inherent things in capitalism that encourage that those power relations that are so inequitable? I think that's an important question. I think it's one that Marx um, is very valuable for understanding, uh, mm -hmm. no doubt. So, and we also agree that the list, I, I've seen the list of truly economic sovereign countries be as much as 20, but as little as four, depending on who you're talking to, um, um, because of some of these relationships. Um, there's a couple of questions though that emerged from me that when I started looking into these economically sovereign countries that 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 does trouble me a little bit. One, um, we uh, have already agreed that uh, countries like um, Japan are economically sovereign. Yes. Um, all those countries, however, are in what you would call 
I mean, the core are at least are tangential to the core economies. We all agree with that too. Um, when you say core economies, you're saying the major economies of the world, right? I'm saying that the major economies uh, of the world that have developed production and can produce commodities, goods, real goods. With the exception of those on the euro. So with right. the exception of the countries in the eurozone, I would say, yes, the monetarily sovereign criteria applies uh, currently to the most developed countries in the world, the, the richest countries in the world are able to, they are operating on the principles that MMT describes, correct? Correct. So I'm, I'm just gonna bring up a case study that was popular to talk about, uh, I don't know, um, when Syriza was coming to power in, in sure. Greece. And, oh, great. And, yeah. um, um, <laughs> um, and I, got into a debate with Steve King, who again, is not an mmt here. And actually I think some of MMT's positions might be slightly more coherent than some of what he said. Um, what I don't know from, from that exchange was if, for example, Greece was to leave the Eurozone, could it actually truly have established economic sovereignty? Um, yeah, and, great question. Yeah. Sorry, go on. I, I didn't mean so, to so, and there's a couple of reasons why, and it has to do not with the currency question, but with the question of real material uh, of will material power in such a small country that is resource bound and its traditional yeah. commodity production would be related to things that are not as valuable in the modern economy. And they yeah. could shift, of course, but. Yeah, great. So a um, couple things. Um, as you pointed out, in terms of the currency, um, no problem, right? So it'd be able to, Greece, if it left the euro, would be able to issue its own currency, it would be able to tax in its own currency, and it wouldn't be taxing its population in any currency other than its own, and it would have a floating currency, right? The drachma. Mm. And in order to meet that criteria, they would have to have a developed enough economy to do so. Before the sovereign debt crisis in the eurozone that the eurozone created, Okay, by virtue of bad policy, by bad treaties, imposing unnecessary restrictions on Eurozone members, Greece had exactly that. And they've now been forced to sell off a lot of their public utilities, nationalized ports, et cetera, to foreign owners. So I don't think that they certainly would not be as developed necessarily or have as much policy flexibility if they went to the drachma tomorrow uh, as they did before the advent of the euro. Uh, that being said, they would still be a fully monetarily sovereign nation. The problem that arises, the challenge that they would face if they dropped the euro um, would be a political one. I think there would be a lot of reprisal. There would be a lot of retribution from other eurozone states, including Germany, um, possibly some of the other Central and North American Eurozone states for having abandoned the monetary union. Um, and again, that would be strictly because of political control. The idea that we're going to subjugate this to our will and to what benefits us under the current rules of the Troika, which is the IMF, the uh, Eurogroup, uh, European Commission, um, and uh, the European Central Bank. So I think that there would definitely be some retribution politically for that, um, the, because they don't want to change the, instead of changing the rules, instead of understanding how they could become a mon more monetarily sovereign union, um, they are stuck in a way of thinking in which they are entrenched, right? So they've accepted the monetarist revolution, the neoliberal model of austerity, which is exactly backwards. So what's been imposed on Greece is when they've fallen on recessionary times, what do they get? What's imposed on them by the Troika, right? It's austerity, it's increased taxes and reduced spending. They're forced to reduce their spending and increase taxes in order to get the euros that they need to continue running their government. Um, this is exactly backwards. When you're in a business cycle downturn, you want to what? Decrease taxes and increase government spending. So 
This is a result of poor understanding and entrenched political and economic thought that is really devastating and um, gets the entire paradigm backwards. I agree with most of your assertions, but maybe not the motivational core of yours uh, of uh, why you're describing those assertions. So let me let me get into that for a second. Um, you attend that this is mostly a political problem and about reprisal, correct? And I uh, would yes. agree. I would agree that there would have been reprisal. Um, however, we've already talked about MMT admitting that the real limit to an economy is its material goods and services, and that can be limited by political decisions such yes. such as labor arbitrage, um, unfair currency, di different different ways, unfair currency limitations. Um, yeah. Yeah. Negative regulation. Um, yep. There's a couple of things about that that I find interesting, but I do not know that if if Greece immediately had um, internal, oh, I you said there's no difference between internal and external economic sovereignty, um, according to MMT. If it had economic sovereignty by the standards by the four standards by MMT, it floated the currency. The floating currency, however, in the international trade, even without reprisal. Mm -hmm they would have to trade with a larger power that had more productive capacity, either China, the EU as a whole, or the US probably, maybe Australia. It would be very hard to find a block that doesn't have people with more productive capacity um, and more currency sovereignty um, to trade with. Are we correct on that? Like it would be hard for them. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a good question. So a floating currency is one that is traded on the Forex markets. And one of the things that MMT has noticed is that, you know, well, let me step back for a second. What, what makes the value of a currency that's floating go up or down, right, on the Forex markets? It's the same as with the stock market. It's bids and asks, right? So it's mm -hmm. demand for it on the Forex market makes the value go up, um, purchase orders essentially, and sell orders make the if sell orders exceed purchase orders, it makes the value go down. But what MMT has noticed is that there is no correlation between what a currency is doing on the Forex markets and inflationary pressure. These are not coupled. So whether or not you can expect to see inflation in an economy that's fully, fully monetarily sovereign has nothing to do with the demand for that currency on Forex markets. So. Mm -hmm. The question would be, would people be willing to invest in Greece? Would the Greek economy be able to invest in itself? Do they have the raw material and resources necessary to build up their infrastructure? Greece is not a third world country. It's not a nope. developing nation. So they already have much of that infrastructure. Unfortunately, a lot of it has been sold off because of the constraints imposed by the Eurozone and the Maastricht Treaty have been sold mm -hmm. off to the Chinese control a lot of these ports. Um, I'm sure that uh, German private equity firms uh, have bought up a lot of uh, this debt and now control what used to be under state control by the Greek government. So those are all a problem, okay? But they're not problems that can't be overcome. Greece can get the raw material it needs from other member states. It's just going to require international cooperation. And, and what, what would encourage such international cooperation since the international, we can already see that the adoption of, say, a, malad a seemingly maladaptive ideology by a certain group has put Greece at a distinct disadvantage. In fact, it would, even though it is clearly not a developing nation, um, that um, it has been treated as if it is a periphery economy, sucking yeah. resources out, selling them off to. So, like, what would the, what would the incentive internationally be to do that? Yeah. So again, I think it's going to depend on political arrangements, right? I, the immediate consequence I think would be punitive, right? Or what we referred to earlier as reprisal. It's like, how dare you break from the model that we all agreed to back in 1992 or 93 when the Maastricht Treaty was signed. So you're saying, what is the incentive for countries to give Greece the resources that they might need to develop, right? Well, trade is a big one. Okay, well, you know, Greece does have things to export and they certainly do have things that attract foreign capital, including tourism. And, and that's not a small part of the Greek economy. 
Um, Greek also ha Greece also has a manufacturing sector that would need to be built up. The question is what incentive would say the Germans have for giving primary manufacturing goods to the Greeks who have now, you know, abandoned that uh, regime, the Euro regime. And, and that's a very difficult question. That's a very serious challenge. Um, the solution or at least the transitional solution that former finance minister Yanis Varoufakis gave for this problem when he was finance minister of Greece. Uh, he's now a member of parliament under a new party, a, a sort of post Syriza uh, party or alternative to Syriza essentially party, um, was to create a parallel payment system. Something that would temporarily function like a Bitcoin until the Greek economy could stabilize. And that is not a sustainable long-term solution. Um, Bitcoin at best is digital gold. Um, so it, that is not necessarily something that is going to hold up for the long term. They would have to peg their currency to it. They would have to operate in such a way where there are all these digital transactions paying for goods and services. Um, and they would still be forced to import a lot of goods, but it would also create a lot of new imaginative space inside Greece for worker co-ops, worker democracy, re-examining how surplus value is distributed. Greece has a serious problem, um, as do most well-developed capitalist nations at this point with wealth inequality and most of the capital being concentrated in very few hands at the top of the socioeconomic arc. Okay. so. I will I will accept I find your explanation plausible and and fair. Um, so one of the things that I, I, I pushed back on Steve King when I had this debate about the same thing is that the incentives in the international market, as we agree, and the incentives between states um, would probably lead to a very... A, a very immediate set of problems for Greece. And the answers that have been given seem suboptimal at best. Yeah. Um, I find that this is true for almost every economy outside of the um, developed world and you know, the core economies, as we say in world systems theory. Um, I can give an example for my personal life. I was in Egypt when, um, when a mixture of IMF and Chinese pressure had it float its own, had it try to float its own currency. Yeah. Um, um, and in, in doing so, it immediately had um, hyperinflation um, and it immediately had a problem with reserves. And so, you know, um, no, the reasons for that are not because um, that the, the, the way neoliberals would probably tell you that, you know, that they over, were over profligate or whatever. Um, the reasons for that are that they are forced to buy their goods from, they don't have enough of their own goods and no country does. No country in the world exists, even in the United States under truly autarkic conditions. Like they have to get their, they have to get some of the returns of their material production from somewhere else. Right. Um, and I, I, I respect the fact that MMT is not normative except in the jobs claim. But I fear um, that when I look at the same conditions you do, and I accept all the, almost all the premises, except maybe some of the power relationships, and we'll get into that, um, that I don't really see a way for developing economies to take advantage of this. And I also do not see the incentives for developed economies to ever let them Oh, um, yeah, great. Be yeah. because of things like, not because of currency capture, but because of like wealth capture, labor arbitrage, yep. um, relations of power between states, et cetera. Yep. So that's, so, a, that's a really significant and important challenge that you raise. And it's one that I've spent a lot of time thinking through and working on actually. Um, and Professor Fadel Kaboob has probably mm -hmm. done the best work on this, um, how it is that developing nations can transition their economies in such a way that um, the principles that MMT describes and the insights it offers um, will be the ones that those economies uh, that can now describe the way those economies are operating instead of the way they're currently operating. Right. A um, couple of things here that are, would be essential, right? So one is giving up this notion of 
imposition by the IMF and World Bank that says you have to pursue your comparative advantage. So if you're Jamaica, sell bananas and mm. do that and don't worry about developing, um, getting the raw material to develop your own infrastructure. In the Middle East, you know, we think of there are countries like Iran, for example, which we think of as very oil rich mm. and they are oil rich. The problem is they don't have any refineries. Right. <laughs> so, so they have to export the oil to get it refined and then re-import it for their own population. These are major problems. And you're right. There's a power relation imbalance that causes this. So how do we overcome it? One of the ways, and there's actually good evidence for this very recently, um, is through fear, <laughs> frankly. Um, the IMF and World Bank are now talking about in the last two weeks, hey, um, we're, we're seriously considering all third world developing nation debt. It's like, oh, really? Where did that come from? Well, one is they're realizing that this, like the monetarist revolution is over and it was never true to begin with, that it was based on faulty claims and that the COVID crisis throughout the world has brought those um, realities to bear, that this is not actually how economies operate in terms of their fiscal and monetary processes, but that what MMT describes is, ac is actually uh, accurate. Um, so they're talking about debt forgiveness. Now, why? Well, because they're afraid of a lot of things, mass migration, right? Mm -hmm. War, civil strife, um, immigration, terrorism, you name it. So now they're looking very seriously at debt relief. They realize it's both economically feasible and, and they're afraid of losing power. <laughs> so those two things combined, the elites that run these organizations are concerned for um, what it does to preserve their own statuses. There's, there's no doubt about it. And for what it might mean for their own countries vis-a-vis -vis these people having to flee their homes because they're unable to develop their economies because they owe so much money to this and that country in euros or dollars, as you mentioned before. So those are real challenges. Um, and this is gonna require like, as you're, you know, what you're really suggesting is just like, what is the incentive for these countries to do that? You know, I mean, we're talking about a lot of uh, former colonies of Western imperialist nations, mm -hmm. um, which are happy in, in many ways to keep their thumb on these countries and continue to exploit the cheap labor of these countries and prevent them from having monetary sovereignty. Uh, this is a serious political problem and it needs, and it's a, an important challenge and it needs to be addressed in that way. The thing to keep in mind is, is it's not an economic problem. Um, it is an economic choice as a result of these political coercive imbalances that you described. As I, I will assert my uh, Marxism here a little bit, I don't sure. know that there is a difference between economic and political problems, but um, in, in, in any field of anything. But, but that aside, I, I find this, this power relationship that we, hit, we have here interesting in the case of MMT. It is definitely true in the United States, unquestionably, that we could be we could be doing tons more public spending. Even if you don't accept MMT, let's just say, say you're just a regular old Nancy Pansy, old fashioned Keynesian. Yeah. Um, that that we we see that there is a that inflation is not particularly going up. That um, that. There is no reason why we couldn't, without even risk to fairly traditional models of the economy, where we could not spend a lot more. Um, the deficit, I mean, we all know that in power, no one actually really cares. It, it, weirdly, actually, the only people who kind of care are Democrats, but um, when they're actually in power. But, you know, Republicans, for as much as they talk about it, they don't care. Um, which, which, Tell, which is about what I find MMT bracketing out. And maybe this is a point of disagreement between us. And maybe it's actually a point where, where your MMT sees its limits. I don't know, because MMT, again, we're accepting that except for the full jobs guarantee is not normative. Um, it just describes things as they are in, in capitalism. Now, sure. the, the, the debate here 
um, is really what implications does this have for post for post capitalism? And, and to get into that, we need to get into some other definitions that we haven't gone into. Um, the first is we keep on talking about currency as if everybody knows what it is, and I, I want to spell out um, the difference. Um, what the standard view of currency is is three functions, and then the difference in neo chartalism and specifically neo chartalism is not true of classical chartalism, so I'm not going to bring that up. Um, so we have money is a store of value. Yep. Money is a um, is a promise to pay an IOU. A promise to pay an IOU, a, a, and money is a medium exchange, except that. Um, Classically speaking, neo charlism which takes its its keys here, I believe, from uh, Alfred Mitchell Innes, right? Yep. Yep. Um, that the medium of exchange is a misunderstanding of right. the standard deferred payment. Correct. That's absolutely right. Yeah, because when you're talking about medium of exchange, it, it you're back to the idea of a substitute for barter, a, a simple way to sort of lubricate exchange so that instead of trading you uh, bananas for chickens. I have these seashells that represent the thing that I am now trading that has a certain value connected to uh, chickens and um, bananas. Um, and, you know, that's the Robinson Crusoe, Crusoe story right. of how money came into existence. And um, <laughs> from, from archaeological records going back 5,000 years, all of the evidence is in exactly the opposite direction that money came about always including um, in pre-state civilizations as a result of a central authority imposing it as a fine or a tax yeah right and so you had something representing the extraction of things in kind usually and that is the beginning of currency that was debt and credit also so that you could get things in kind for for that script it was you know and it was done by some kind of central authority not necessarily a modern state we we, we completely agree on that it's actually one of my um bugaboos with marxist is uh, the assumption um just because it is assumed in the critique of capital that that is uh that that is necessarily true um for the, the robinson crusoe model um there's very little uh, um there's almost no uh evidence for it um, the, the only examples we have of barter from anthropology are between groups, not within them in early, um, in, in early society. So again, no, no contest for me here. Um, but <laughs> I, went through, I went through both Mosler and Ray's examples of how this was established. And every yeah. single one of them <laughs> are imperial. And they're about forcing people into yes. the labor circuit. Oh, it's absolutely, like, it's absolutely coercive. I mean, uh, you may have heard... Warren Mosler's example of like, I've got, have you heard this one where, you know, he's, he, the metaphor that he gives is I've got a bunch of people in a room and I, I need somebody to clean the floor. And I say, okay, who wants my business card? Have you heard this one? Yeah. I, I, okay. Yeah. So uh, for the sake of the audience, I'll do it. Um, anybody can create money, right? Anybody can create money and currency is just the state's money. That's mm -hmm. what it is. So there's money. And then what we call currency is the state's version of money. So anything that's state money, we call currency, okay? So anybody can, you know, you and I can create Derricks and, you know, kangaroos. We can go to our printer and print them out. The, the trouble, the trick is in getting it accepted. And the getting accepted part is arguably very coercive, which is what you're referring to, okay? <laughs> so the metaphor that uh, Warren Mosler likes to give, and I'll, I'll do it, I'll, I'll, I'll do what he does. He says, okay, um, we're in a room. There's a bunch of people. I, I need, uh, I want someone to uh, clean the floor and in exchange, I'll give you my business card. So he holds up his business card and says, you know, if you clean the floor before this meeting is over, I'll give you my business card. Who wants one of my business cards? And of course, nobody wants his business card. It's worthless, right? And then he says, you can't leave the room without one of my business cards. And if you try, I've got my guy at the door, you know, the bouncer who with a nine millimeter, okay? What have you done? You've literally just created unemployment. Everybody in that room is now unemployed and is gonna be fighting over those business cards, right? Mm -hmm. And in order to get them, they have to provide 
a good or service to you. Now, what do you as the business card holder represent? You're the issuing authority. You're the central authority issuing the business cards. You're the government in this case. The guy at the door with the nine millimeter, that's the tax man, okay? And everybody in that room who now needs your business cards is the private sector, right? Is the, is the population. And you have to provision yourself. Now, the, so yes, one can say that that's, okay, inherently coercive. But here's the thing. By virtue of having a government in the first place, okay, we expect something from that government. And in order for the government to provide whatever it is we expect from them, they need to employ the population. What in econ speak is called provision itself. They need mm -hmm. people to build the roads and bridges that you expect them to build or to provide for the common defense by funding a military, by getting people to join the army, et cetera. And so that's where it comes in is that the imposition of the tax is what creates demand for the currency, right? We can't, mm -hmm. pay, we can't pay for our groceries in chickens because your grocery store can't use those chickens to pay its taxes, you know? And the same thing goes with households on the individual level. So you're right, there is definitely a coercive element there. And the question is to what degree or can that be diminished or eliminated altogether by expanding democratic principles and expanding democracy? What if the people were the government, then would it still be coercive? Um, that's, that's a fair question, but I, I have some more questions along that line when we actually look at this and we go back to our Greece example, we look at, what, look at the example of what happened in Egypt. Um, we talk about how China has avoided this by basically accepting a certain amount of, um, it, you know, it's deliberately undervalued. It's undervalued its currency. De so devalued. That, yeah. devalued, devalued yeah. its currency um, to, and you know, I'll use scare marks because I realize that this is sort of a ridiculous claim, but to, to effectively to be able to get U.S. currency to buy materials that it needs, not just from the U.S., but from all over the world because of the U.S. hegemony in the market. Um, and I thought about this, and I also think one of the things that is interesting about um, MMT and the, and the core of monetary sovereignty is it is also tied somewhat directly, really, to military sovereignty. Um, yeah. That's right. You have to conscript. Right, that's correct. Because, you know, conscription and having a standing army, uh, if nothing else, that is what the government will have to provision needs in, uh, to provision itself. Right. Is human labor, human bodies. And if you have a, a regime uh, anthropologically like, you know, there, I'm sure there were times in ancient Rome and ancient Greece where th there was a, a dearth of public services being provided by the central authority, but they still had an army and that army needs conscripts. And mm -hmm. that's how they got the money accepted um, is by saying, OK, look, there's this tax that I'm going to impose um, in order for you to pay it. You're going to have to do work for us. Um, the job that we need done right now is. Uh, going to conquer our neighbors. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely and, right. Yeah. And so, so what I find interesting about chartalism, and I'll, I'll give you my my other bias now. Um, come, and I'm I'm talking about classical chartalism here. Was this relationship to Marxism and the an, initial instantiation one that I actually find very underexplored? Um, and the reason why I I find it underexplored. It actually was a tension within the early Marxist group. It was a tension between Marx and Ferdinand Lassalle. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I, maybe you're getting to where I'm going about, with my concerns about MMT too. But well, let's get let's get to the story about about Lassalle. Lassalle was a jurist and was the was the founder of what would become the SPD Day in Germany. Um, he took a bunch of illegal anarchist, socialist, communist. Marxist groups, um, mostly in the form of unions, um, had them form a political alliance. That political alliance developed into a parliamentary party. Um, LaSalle uh, um, drafted the Goethe program, which Marx most famously critiqued, but their biggest fight actually was probably not that. It was about the relationship to the German state. And it 
was a major issue because, because LaSalle thought as a jurist that the law was above class and that it was neutral. Ah, okay, yep. And he also at the same time, because he was a contemporary of Knapp, adopted the view that the charterless view that money was a function of law. One that, as far as it, as far as we call state money, fiat currency is a function of law. There is no like Absolutely. this is objectively true. Yeah. Um, this led Ferdinand uh, Lasalvo to try to make deals with Bismarck. Um, and in fact, the full extent of this was not known until after his death, when his private letters to Bismarck, and literally, you know, at one point he was literally trying to suppress democracy in the country um, because he thought it was too bourgeois. Um, this uh, thus infuriating Marx, and while Marx had cried his funeral, they he would not let um, people associated with with his with the First International fully join the SP Day until Lasalle was dead, um, and it had to do with empowering the German state. And what is one of the first things Bismarck did with some of that power was the anti-socialist laws. Yep. Now. One of the things that I find interesting about MMT is I think its description is absolutely correct. I think its description of the way currency in the modern world is absolutely correct. It does bracket out some commodity stuff, but not, but it's indirectly in because of the formal nature of currency after 1930. Um, and that it's fairly honest about the power relationships of this, but it then takes these power relationships and says that we can end, well, let me just not MMT, certain MMTers, Mm -hmm. who, who think that there are pretty good policy implications um, to this can take this function of coercion, which is, which is this hidden relationship of coercion and currency, and use it to provide all these, these things to the economy. And it is, again, I agree with you, it is a political problem because the separation of political and economics is fake anyway. But, um, <laughs> but my concern is I don't know what evidence you have that they would ever allow that. Like, like. Yep. <laughs> yep. And that's one of my main challenges to MMT is that, you know, I say, look, what we're describing to, to take, to take full advantage of what we're describing, we need a very different incarnation of our political legislative bodies, for example. Right. And that's just the tip of the iceberg is if you want to really take advantage of what MMT describes in an economy, you have to have a very nimble Congress. Um, if, your interest, if your political persuasion is more on the left, now you need a Congress or a parliament that is very left oriented in order to get those policy uh, implications that use MMT um, or that take advantage of MMT's uh, insights. And so this, this is a real problem, right? And like you have to overhaul the budgeting process in the United States in order to make fiscal adjustments on the fly. Uh, so how do you do all this, right? So I mean, one mean is to simply say, okay, look, the more people understand this, the more pressure that they're going to apply on the political system. They're no longer going to tolerate the how you're gonna pay for that question because now they know that that's a ruse and it's the wrong question and they have the right answer to it. So that's one avenue but we both know that like political power is not going to simply con like <laughs> uh, concede its political power in favor of policies that um may benefit the masses but may not necessarily benefit like the private equity firms that are happy to see a, an economy that relies on credit and may have um you know policy makers and lawmakers in their pocket so it's true that like you have to have reform and political reform. And that's why when Bernie Sanders was talking about a political revolution, these were the kinds of things that he was saying is we have to overhaul the way that we operate within these institutions to make the institutions more democratic. And if we can talk also about, you know, extricating ourselves from capitalism versus trying to seize mm -hmm. institutional power to make that change, I'm sure, you know, we're going to be uh, on opposite sides of that coin. Um, but I do see some real possibility just based on <laughs> this is the important part. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm still here. 
Okay, I'm still here. I'm still here. So I do see, like I was saying, I do see some possibilities right now as a result of COVID for things like um, a general strike to get these demands met. So the general strike, these demands are made, the pressure is applied to the system. They come back at us with how are you going to pay for that? And we say, actually, we know exactly how we're going to pay for that. We're going to pay for that the way we've been paying for it for almost 100 years now. Um, now, is that the solution to capitalism? Absolutely not. <laughs> is that the solution to all of the ills that capitalism spurs? Of course not. But it does widen our imaginative horizons for creating more democratic social arrangements, giving people more resources, allowing for more time. And mm -hmm. there is actually, I, I should not be offering strategy to Marxists here. I might come to regret it someday. But, uh, <laughs> but if I was arguing for MMT from a Marxist perspective, and I think this is actually one of the reasons why we had a number of Marxists show up at the annual MMT conference at Stony Brook University last year, um, quite a number actually, I was surprised, um, is because the federal jobs guarantee, one of the things that I, I hear from so many Marxists is, you know, technology is going to displace labor and then there will be a falling rate of uh, profit that ends up at zero and uh, we'll have all of these machines making all of these things that nobody can buy and that'll lead to collapse. Um, one of the many ways in which Marxists argue, including Ted Reese, who I argued on this program last time, argues uh, will lead to collapse. And um, th this is uh, simply um, an unnecessary, it's a, it's, a, it's a dubious fear. It's a very dubious fear. And, but if I was strategizing for Marxists via MMT, I'd say, look, Let's say it's legitimate and it's happened, right? That it happens, all right? Now you have a federal jobs guarantee that's employing a massive percentage of the population. There's, there's your labor army right there. Fair enough. Um, however, <laughs> I, there's a couple of issues with the jobs guarantee that always fascinated me, okay? Um, and and it's, it's because, and it, again, it has to do with power relations not the instruments of which MMT is talking about, and also what those power relations are really about, which is the accumulation of wealth. And no, no one really, no one actually cares about currency. Well, okay, they do, but in so much that they do, they care about what currency can buy or what power it can hold them. Exactly. Right. Um, so, but let's talk about the jobs guarantee. Sure. So um, let's, I'm going to take, Kelton's, uh, Kelton's model, uh, Stephanie Bell Kelton's model, and Stephanie um, Kelton, yeah, yeah, Kelton, um, because I think it's a little, I, und I, it was a little bit more um, cut and dry than the than the version that was in um, Warren Mosler's uh, book, but we could talk about so, both. Um, so if Kelton just says well, we have a blanket, uh, uh, a blanket minimum, like a service core or jobs guarantee, and it's going to be, uh, I think Mosler proposed it at like eight dollars but that was a long time ago it would be higher mm -hmm. than that now um uh and and that would be good right and it would be good for a variety of reasons you have a you have an army of labor um um you have you well have, that's how i think it would be good for marxists <laughs> yeah. it, it'd if, be good for their worst if their worst fears come to fruition about you know dear god the robots are coming but yeah go on yeah well i i for for one it, um I think the Grossman interpretation of, of crisis is actually contested within even that brand of Marxism. And two, um, although there's, I think there's some validity to it if you're stuck on commodity money. Um, and two, uh, which we're not. Um, and two, <laughs> um, the, the, the other thing that I think there's another interpretation of Marxism is this crisis actually regenerates capital every time that, the, that it actually through undervaluation and the, the, sometimes the literal destruction of capital that the overproduction problem are, you know, is, yep. is, is fixed. Um, and, and when that doesn't happen, there's generally war, but like, um, okay, fine. But the labor guarantee. Okay, so let's get into that. Would the government be able to fire 
would would the government be able to fire workers and for something? Let's say they come into the job drunk. Yep. Okay, so they would, but they would be promised a a job somewhere else, right? Because we still would need full employment for this to have the effect that it wouldn't have. It's a transitional. The federal jobs guarantee is a transitional job, right? Okay. So even though it is public sector work, it sits separately from regular public sector work. It is work that is available to anyone and everyone who wants a job. And the idea is to transition from that job to a private or public sector job. And that this transition is facilitated by the federal jobs guarantee because during business cycle upticks, there is an increase in demand for labor. And the private as well as the regular public sector have to get that labor from somewhere. And they, as we all know, or should know, they all prefer to get it from those who are currently employed or have a recent work history mm-hmm. than those who have been long-term unemployed and had their, have had their skills go into decline or um, you know, haven't kept up on new skills that might be relevant to the work in which they're doing. Right. So why would, why would a business class other than maybe popular appeal and by, by popular appeal, I actually literally mean counterforce. Counterforce yep. does not necessarily have to be an insurrection, but right. it's got to be force. Um, why would they ever allow that? Because. Oh, that- it's great for them. It's yeah. they, they would absolutely love it. I mean, MMT is actually it's fantastic for business because it increases aggregate demand. Capitalism runs on sales. So mm-hmm. it's if nothing else, in terms of what it does for profit margins, it's great for business. Now, the thing is, it's not great for the private equity firms because they're relying on credit. Right. They're relying on a an economy that is in deficit that is having to dip into its savings. So look at in the 90s when Bill Clinton, under the Clinton economy, we were running budget surpluses, okay? Mm -hmm. When we were running budget surpluses in the United States during the Clinton years, the economy was in deficit because the government's surplus is the private sector's deficit to the penny and vice versa. So what that meant was, okay, as we were paying down the national debt during the Clinton years, that was forcing people to rely on more and more bank credit, more and more leverage. And then what did you get at the end of that period? You got the dot-com bust, okay, which was being held up, that bubble was being held up by credit money, not high-powered money. High-powered money is Federal Reserve money that's injected into the economy. Credit money is the money that's created by commercial banks when they make loans. So why would the business sector go for it? They would go for it because it doesn't cost them anything and they have a more reliable labor force from which to rely and to hire um, and to promote from the federal jobs guarantee into a similar or elevated role either in a private firm or in the regular public sector itself that pays more money than what the federal jobs guarantee would pay. The number that's been floated and widely accepted under current economic conditions as we're sitting here today is $15 an hour for a federal okay. jobs guarantee job. Right, which is, is, is a similar thing to the, the, the current push by most progressives for a $15 an hour minimum wage. All right, which would be, which was not actually a living wage and that's part of the point. Um, I agree with that, by the way. I mean, cost of <laughs> cost of living is is different. Uh, you know, New York versus Montana uh, is a big difference. Um, and yet, because of the price anchor mechanism of the federal jobs guarantee, you cannot have a change in that price between cost of living. This is where something like a supplemental um, progressive uh, basic dividend or progressive supplemental dividend could come into play. We could talk about that later. Yanis Varoufakis, who I mentioned earlier, has proposed uh, what I think is an excellent uh, solution to that problem. Mm -hmm. So um, the issue that I I would of course take with this is that it seems to alleviate class conflict automatically. Um, To to alleviate class conflict? It just removed, because you just told me that if it would actually be good for most of the sectors in business, not the finance sector, which would be devastated. 
to to have a well trained workforce, which they don't have to train. They now they have now offsided that out to the government that that has purchasing power because now they have money and that's good. So it in some ways this model that you have um, spelled out to me is is a uh, fiscal policy kind of Fordism with the state acting as the the broker. Um, as, a, as instead of say just the firm itself. Um, now, the other the other thing that that I'm interested in is we all we've been establishing this entire time the real limit to the economy is wealth uh, wealth and skills that you know, and that and that what people want is also wealth and skills. Like people care about about currency because of the power it gives them and because of the access it gives them to material things. Yeah. Um, I have a hard time with this idea that business that that it could be both good for business and good for the workers in the long run. I have no problem with it in the immediate run. And in fact, I have often said that in in immediate policies, I would not oppose anything any MMT or a post Keynesian suggests if it was alleviating for the work for the working class. I don't believe weird theories like we should bait and switch them and make things worse so they get radical and rebel. I can't think of anything more more bad faith and inhumane than that kind of crap. But you know, so I, I want to take that off the table immediately. Sure. But <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so by taking by taking advantage of MMT's um, insights, okay, that means we get to spend money into the economy. We have more policy space. Policy space becomes more flexible. Who gets that added wealth in the economy is a political decision, right? So, if you are if you are Mitch McConnell. What you're going to do to take advantage of MMT is do exactly what Reagan did to take advantage of what MMT describes and what Trump did to take advantage of what MMT describes, which you, is you are going to cut taxes on the rich. You're going to cut taxes on the 1%. That's not the way it has to go. In conjunction, regulation, as Derek mentioned earlier, is very integral to taking full advantage of MMT. If you want to avoid monopoly power, if you want to break monopolies, if you want to give opportunity, and I really want to get into this too, is like workplace democracy, um, you can do that. So there is nothing inherent in MMT that says all of the gains added to an economy have to go to the top. There's nothing inherent or innate in it. Right. So which to suggest that. Sure. sure. So, so what what I would say to that is, um, is MMT in and of itself seems to because it is a it is a descriptive paradigm describing capitalism as it is now, yeah. um, is is class and state theory neutral, um, even though it is dependent That's on correct. both in some ways, which which is both a, a virtue of it being empirical and a problem when you're dealing with politics because it doesn't as you admitted. It might give you some wedges, and we disagree on exactly what that would imply, how that would, how the class, how different sections of the class would play out. And I, I want to, but I want to talk about what you just said about MMT. I want to give an example of what we're seeing right now. Um, weirdly, there are wackadoo conservatives who will say that it's Trump's, Trump's policies on immigration. There are people who will say that it's just, you know, like me, that it was a natural state of the business cycle. We did see improvements in the economy across the board at the end of this last business cycle. And then and then, and ex, for, for once an exogenous, not an endogenous shock, you know, accelerated the downward turn that was probably beginning to happen. Anyway, um, the, we, we then saw a ton of quanti uh, quantitative easing. I realize that MMT is not quantitative easing. It requires tax policy and that cannot just be done by the Fed in our current uh, governmental model. Right. And I, um, but that quantitative easing 
did something very interesting and you talked about sectional inflation. And I think, um, I just sectoral, noticed that yeah, sectoral, yeah, inflation. sectoral inflation, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, I noticed that during this time period that quantitative easing went into, you had the hypervaluation of paper assets and you also saw, and people misinterpret this. People think this is, this is a transfer of wealth, um, from the bottom to the top, and what this actually is is a, ca is a capturing of assets and the, and the destruction of wealth at the bottom. It's not going to the top. It's just, you know, it's literally just not flowing. That velocity is not getting out there. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's it's the padding of corporate balance sheets by the federal government. Yeah. Right, and, and it works the way MMT would describe. So, as a political choice in the current thing in the United States, we see that any MMT policy that's likely to be in, implemented, not by someone like Bernie Sanders. And we've also seen the current uh, party system being there, bourgeois parties, make sure that, the, that Bernie Sanders only got so far. Right. Um, right. And whether, you know, um, whether by, whether legitimately, illegitimately is not my place to say, but, but whatever, there's, there's a hard limit to that. Um, I don't see how MNT by itself will, would really do that much for us. However, I can see how understanding the way it, the way that it changes, um, the way that it changes power relationships is super important for us to, to do anything going forward. But I am not sure that the current policy regular uh, policy proposals made by MMTers go anywhere near enough. And I, I think they seem to be popular in the press because they do give us a leverage and I think that's real, but they also kind of, they, they, they seem to, to, to make this, at least in the short run, where, where the, the upper classes don't really have to pay anything for this to happen. That's right. That's right. They don't like they literally I, I don't need Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg or anybody who is a billion or, or Elon Musk's money in order to finance government spending. Now, that doesn't mean that if I'm so politically or, you know, that if my political orientation is such that I shouldn't tax them, it doesn't mean that. Um, we shouldn't have a wealth tax. It doesn't mean that there shouldn't be an estate tax. It doesn't mean that I shouldn't take those measures to narrow the gap between rich and poor. Uh, it simply identifies the real reasons by which we tax, right? So we tax for the social engineering purposes that I just described. Uh, we tax to mitigate inflation, okay? Because uh, when we tax, we're deleting money from the economy. That's less money that people have to spend. All right. And we, intact, we, and we tax to create, as we discussed earlier, a demand for the currency itself. Right. But um, states need physical things, right? We agree with this, correct? Mm -hmm. And we, we, what we're saying is um, the taxation is not to extract those physical things, but to compel them. But effectively, um, it, it is a way to capture them. Now, what 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 you what you to to my to my knowledge, even if you know, even if MMT is true, you would almost have to change everything about the currently existing state for it to be politically viable. Um, <laughs> I think it depends. I think it will. Let's remember. Let's remember that we're talking about we're talking about pre-existing arrangements in the economy, right? So what right, you're saying, are. just to be clear, is that to fully take advantage of it in a way that would give us, in in the case of the United States, single payer health care, Green New Deal, uh, living wage, federal jobs guarantee, you know, a whole host of progressive, socially democratic. Um, policies and programs, we would have to take advantage of it to a degree that we're not currently taking advantage of what it describes and that we can't get there because of these political impediments uh, as a result of power relations where we have political power essentially serving capital instead of capital serving political power. What MMT, one of the implications for MMT is that we can change that arrangement, right? And so if you look at 
countries that I would argue currently, and the U.S. has democratic institution, institutions, they just don't mm -hmm. function democratically, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if we look at countries that are also doing this, like Japan, like Japan is a, is a really good example of what I'm driving at here. Japan for decades now has had no inflation. Mm -hmm. They currently have zero GDP growth, okay? Mm -hmm. And the whole thing, they have a 250% debt to GDP ratio, mm -hmm. but they're a monetary sovereign and everything works just fine. Okay. Now, when I say everything works just fine, I'm not saying that people don't have um, work life ex uh, alienation and existential alienation and interpersonal alienation as a result of capitalism, which still exists in that country, despite the fact that they don't have GDP growth, they have, you know, all of the things that I described because they still have surplus value and they still have private property, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it eliminates those things. When I say it works just fine, I'm saying they don't have these massive economic crises that we face in the United States. They've been able to mitigate business cycle downturns. They don't have to pursue GDP growth because they realize how their economy actually works. Um, and we can do that too. In fact, I would argue that reducing GDP growth right now and having a zero growth rate policy um, may actually be, well, not right now while we're facing COVID and businesses aren't operating, but under normal conditions would actually be essential to help stave off some of the worst possible consequences of climate change. I, okay, um, I would agree with a lot of what you're saying with, with, with one interesting caveat about Japan. Um, and we've talked about the power relations hidden in this and we've talked about Japan. I mean, we could talk about Japan's actually very unique history in that regard um, as part of the geostrategic plan of the United States. Um, but one of the things I noticed about Japan is Japan also, I hate to use the term hedges its bets, but hedges its bets in some ways. Because one of the things Japan also has as part of its it's part of its uh, debt load doesn't care about it doesn't care about its debt to GDP ratio it doesn't care about growing its GDP you're completely correct but it does seem to care about being able to trade and it seems to hedge its bets against the United States in some ways by having gold reserves um, now that doesn't that doesn't question anything that you said about the actual internal workings of 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 MMT it does not I'm not. I am not throwing that into doubt. It, it makes me wonder about all the power relations that are in play, which are probably larger than any one nation can decide, even the United States. Yeah, and, and so, we, just, we just have to like for clarity point out too. Well, I mean, that suggests, let's, let's be clear, right? I mean, <laughs> MMT is not an America first. Um, the implications for taking full advantage of what MMT describes are not an America first uh, orientation. And the gold reserves that you're talking about in Japan, uh, whatever they may be, their currency is not fixed to those gold reserves. Absolutely they not. You're correct. <clears throat> like, I'm not, I just, you're at, you, they're absolutely not fixed to those gold reserves. Those gold reserves are, are separate and they seem to be for a different function. Um, and so, that, like I said, it is not a it is it is not a critique of any of the objective conditions that MNT is describing in the way fiat currency works. It is not an objective critique of the way a way it describes Japan's working. It just makes me have some doubts because no, I, I don't know I don't know many MMTers. Maybe there are some. I think maybe Steve Bannon, right, for for the MNT on off days or something. But um, you know, there's an evil version of everything. Yeah. Um, um, but I don't think most MMTers believe or, or think that that MMT nece is necessarily an American a first policy. Right. And um, I just wonder if because of the objective conditions we are describing come out of a certain set of power relations, there's no way for it to somewhat not be. But again, we would have to be able to frankly compel these these changes that are are implied um, are possible le uh, levers to know. Um, that's right. And that has not been allowed to happen. In well, most I, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that's been really encouraging to me that I was like, not entirely shocked, but let's say severely surprised to discover 
um, about two weeks ago, Larry Summers, who, uh, you know, I'm in the audience and I'm sure yourself will know is, you know, one of these neoliberal icons um, to uh, Giannis Varoufakis, uh, former finance minister who I invoked earlier, who was in the Syriza government that you brought up, um, used to refer to as the Prince of Darkness. Two weeks ago, he was on like Bloomberg Business or... <laughs> Or like CNBC or one of these like financial like networks, like mainstream U.S. networks saying that the monetarist revolution is over and that we realize that fiscal policy is the only way forward and that the IMF is being seriously, uh, seriously considering and being advised by people like himself and others like Dean Baker to forgive all developing world debt. So that's really interesting. Now, what I see there in Marxist terms is a window of opportunity that has opened, right? Where mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of the critical factor um, is at a, a pressure point. And the question is whether or not we're going to realize what's happening and force our way through it, right? Uh, if we don't, you know, again, in Marxist terms, the whole world is lost, right? So the subjective factor in all of this is, I think, at a near breaking point. What are we going to do about it? You know, what are the ways in which we can decide we're going to make our own workplace arrangements? We're gonna, are we going to... I agree with you that I don't think we can simply rely on elected officials, given like the political realities of a country, especially like the United States, to just understand this and then do it because you know 90 percent of washington is corrupt one way or another whether it be normatively or literally in a financial sense um it's going to require masses of people to understand that they're essentially getting um ripped off and that they're not getting they're not seeing the fruits of the collective labor and productivity that um, has been generated in the economy and that our productive output could be more equitably distributed if they want to, if we want to, and that it's not a matter of tax revenue. It's not a matter of finding the money to pay for it. We are not talking about MMT. MMT should never be called a policy. It is not a, a switch or something that you apply. And that's always important to keep in mind. It is, as you said, it's empirical. It's a description of how the economy actually operates. All right. Um, my my response to that is is that our fundamental disagreements are not about the description that that MMT describes. It is about what it would take um, to fundamentally change the economy. If MMT is part of a transition to something else, it is like any other part of the capitalist economy, including the state um, itself, which you would need to um, have the leverage to control. Um, the, and so by itself, it, it just gives you some, maybe, um, ways to to do that. I I tend to think that it's that because of the bracketing out of class relations and the nature of the state, um, that it does not necessarily necessarily give you a whole lot in and of itself, other than a few policy things that you could do to more equally change the the, the battlefield, so to speak. Um, and what I mean by that, um, so you talk about the the jobs guarantee, which I just don't think is politically going to happen, barring either the general strike, which has not happened. Um, ever, or, or, or um, compelled force of some variety or another. And, and so I find the idea that we can just do this by, by even legislative fiat or by an executive plan to be more than naive. And I, my reasons for that have to do with class analysis, have to do with power analysis within the state, and have to do with what the fact that what we're actually fighting over is the access to material wealth. And um, I think some of the initial conditions of MMTS described in some of these policies seem kind of have your cake and eat it too, e, and they would and they would not and they would still lead to um, 
you know, they would probably lead to a more humane capitalism. And maybe that maybe a more humane capitalism would create the space to get out. But historically speaking, we have not yet seen that because if it had happened anywhere on earth, we would know. So, so, you know, I, in some ways we're debating um, a counterfactual for both of us, you know, and, and I, I would say that in the immediate future, that people should take some of MMT's policies seriously, but start really thinking about beyond the possibility of these policies happening and the suggestions, how you would actually manifest them. And, and lastly, maybe, maybe a little bit, the Prince of Darkness is of this world um, um, might, might be scared right now. The, the Prince of Darknesses have been scared before. I mean, we talked about FDR, we can talk about FDR as a hero, but FDR had, uh, 20 years of a labor movement and a very, very scary new state on the world stage to compel some actions that capitalists had resisted in worse depressions prior to the 1930s. Um, and those levers also still required a whole lot of things that we haven't talked about. I mean, like including war. Yep. Um, and so, so, you know, I, I sometimes think if we present MMT alone because and then talk about policies implied by MMT, because I agree with you, it, it is not a policy suggestion. It is a it is a theory of the circuit of money. Um, I, I was a theory of the circuit of fiat money in particular. I mean, we, even get, we didn't talk about other kinds of money um, that uh, that <laughs> I just don't I just don't think it's going to be enough. And I don't think you're even saying it would be like so that I, like, I'm not even sure that we totally disagree. But yeah. we, we might disagree on how we could compel this. But Yeah, absolutely. I, I think everything that you've just mentioned is are important considerations. Um, but they also have, MMT also has implications for the arrangements that would exist in an anarchist syndicalist society, in a Marxist arrangement, as well as the destinations that both those socialist ideologies seek to reach, which is communism, right? Um, and, and I'm happy to do um, another debate uh, at another date and time where we go over blueprints for, for how to get there. Um, and if uh, it's all right with both of you, I'm, I'm happy to, to leave it at that and, and go on to Q&A. Yeah, it's okay with me. All right. Okay. I'm guessing that is Ted Reese. <laughs> it looks great. I love it. Hi, Ted. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Ted says it When does socialism as opposed to what? As a post-monetary, he's, he's using oh. the definition of socialism as a post-monetary system. Ah, okay. Um, yeah. So I, I, I completely reject the notion that you can't um, have socialism with currency uh, or a monetary system because any social unit of account is, as far as I'm concerned, a monetary system. At, by the same token, I don't think that you do necessarily need currency. Uh, actually, you wouldn't have currency as such because you wouldn't have nation states, but certainly there would be some sort of um, issuing authority for a unit of exchange, whether it be a strictly social credit or some kind of money exchange that is democratically distributed or based on the syndicalist model that anarchists are currently using in places like Rojava. Um. I, I I would I would say if uh, I don't think capitalism can be MMT to wait, I don't even think most MMTers would even suggest that. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but it, even even those who want to get beyond capitalism seem to see that at best a as a transitionary point within capitalism, right? That's why we talk about post-capitalism as opposed to socialism or whatever. Um, 
The other thing is uh, we could get into the contentions of inter-Marxist debates about whether or not things like labor credits are actually money. And I actually weirdly would agree with Sam on the fact that they're still money. Um, this is a debate I have in Marxist circles all the time. Um, and if they are not money, I don't really know how they work. They're just ration tickets. So um, uh, beyond that, um, I, also don't, I also think like thinking in terms of 19th century like chits is weird. Like, anyway, um, uh, you know, I, I think class conflict is where this comes down and how you resolve that is, is an open question. And one of the things that I've been arguing with other Marxists about, who try to pull from the early 20th century model of Marxism is that happened in wartime before nukes. Um, and so, um, and why that is important could be, could be debated at another time, but and not subject to the criterion of this debate, but um, I don't necessarily think that they're that that's going to be the greatest guide either. Um, yeah, that's my answer. Let me uh, let me just respond to that uh, to make clear that um, I think that if we take advantage of what MMT describes, and by take advantage I mean for the left, that we can reach a post-capitalist. Um, arrangement of post-capitalist world and post-capitalist societies. Um, in addition, I would say that, um, or to give examples that would be fundamental to that are the principle of one employee, one share, one vote. Um, moving in these directions will get us to a point where the return on capital is such that there might be, for example, a 100% dividend as a result of AI or robotics or, or what have you. Um, but all of this requires public mission, right? It requires a society that has agreed to a certain set, set of outcomes that it would like to achieve. And for me as an anarchist, I think it's important to lead by example. So if this thing that I am claiming would be better is in fact better, people will support it. Uh, the question then becomes, how do we demonstrate that to the a political authority. Well, fundamentally, I don't think it's about appealing to them. Um, it may be right now in our current, like this is what needs to be done to alleviate as much suffering as possible. But I think much more important is um, direct action. All right. Right. So let's let's talk about this this AI thing. First of all, um, I'm a big proponent of getting as much automation and AI into the system as possible. I would love to see people's work weeks reduced to 15 hours a week. Um, I think it would change labor uh, capital relations for the better, um, and that we would have more time to actually do the things that we have uh, a real that give us a real sense of purpose that help us to self-aggrandize. Okay, now this question about whether or not it's going to displace uh, workers in a way where no one will be able to afford the goods and services that are being produced. Couple of points. Here. Sorry, I mean, before we have Why? Okay, so I, I, I disagree. Um, machines, uh, if you have a, an AI, if you have an Android that doesn't need to eat or sleep and it works faster than a human being, uh, by what tenants, by what metrics would you think that with increased efficiency, they wouldn't be able to um, extract more surplus value? If you're, if you're strictly looking at surplus value as 
in terms of human labor, then you're missing the, the point about, you're missing the key bit about, okay, what is my investment capital in output? Okay, I have to buy a machine and I'm buying a machine instead of purchasing labor. Okay, if that machine is cheaper than the labor, then why wouldn't my profit margins increase? That's, that's, that's fine. Are you interested in the products that they have? Are their products all the same? Are they serving the same region? Um, is, there, is there a public investment that says, hey, what we need is more widgets. And the government says, you know what? The private sector is unwilling to produce widgets. Therefore, we will invest in producing widgets. And that might mean setting up a worker cooperative or syndicate to do that. It might mean finding an entrepreneur who's willing to make widgets for the government or, and this is probably my least favored um, of the three, depending on the government in question, have the government itself produce those things and offer them to the public at no, at cost, essentially, essentially at cost. So what, what, we're, what I'm talking about here, Steve, is um, government as employer and investor of last resort. And when I say investor, I mean in land, labor, and capital. All right. I think so, I'll let you I think we'll just... so, so what I will say um, in response to that is um, I when you get when you get to the government acting um, to create widgets or whatever at cost, um, you are not extracting surplus value and that's fine. And that's a simply that that is simply not actually an extractive relation okay that's also fair but at that you know and if if um <laughs> if uh sam is right then you can do that um within capital which i doubt and that's 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 where we're, that's where we're at the, the question about about the exact nature of the declining rates of profits in its relationship to machines um, also doesn't deal with um, what Grossman, what even Grossman called, um, you know, externalities to that, to that trend. There are externalities that cut against that trend. One is that you can increase human efficiency. Another is there are different, there are different regional things. You can, you can deal with it by law. A lot of this and the modern capitalist market is actually handled by IP law, which actually does limit absolute competition, yep. um, which, which is another weird relationship of power and monopoly, but um, it, it does mitigate against some of these things that, that, that pure, and I think in a pure, and I'm putting quote, quote, it's capitalist relation, logically on paper would immediately start drive down uh, prices and thus profits and thus wages. And, you know, um, we could get into when I think that's happened in history before. Um, I also think we, <laughs> Sam and I would disagree about that, but um, that really wasn't, you know, the t like wasn't what I was here to debate. Um, I'm also not sure that that the uh, that the decline in the rates of profits, as understood here, is even totally dependent on machines. Um, any social technology could could create such competition and such without without mitigation. I think my my issue um, with I think my issue with all this is just the what do we think the state actually is and who do we think it actually serves and if sam and i agree on anything it's that we would have to capture by whatever means a whole lot of the apparatus of state to force this and to get rid of the state relation itself um how fast you would want to do that is is open to debate even amongst marxists um, but it does seem that that uh, one of the interesting things about anarchism with MMT characteristics um, is that um, there is a concession that some kind of mediating form would be necessary um, as opposed to like, classic insurrectionary anarchism where we just abolish everything you know tomorrow and we deal with whatever that would entail, which I have no idea what abolishing all all capitalist relations and all state relations and all power all power relationships at once would do. Um, I suspect the anarcho primitivists are actually right on what that means, but not. But I just don't think that's good. Um, so <laughs> it's probably me mass death. Um, but um, you know, uh, we have to deal with uh, with 
the fact that I think what Sam is describing in MMT does eventually become a non a non capitalist relations, and I can't see the ruling class being okay with it for very long. Um, and and really, what this is the really the, the that Sam is right that the impo that the problem of this is political, but what that are political in the sense of politics is power, all right. Um, but what that actually means, um, we probably and it has been implied but not stated disagree on what we think would have to happen to make that work and if we think such reformism would lead to it or be or lead to capitalist capture again and the restart of a different cycle is another open question all right and one that we might have to debate because there is there are tons that there's so much here we can get into i didn't even get into stuff like the ideas, uh, alternate explanations for the conditions MNT displays, such as outsourcing, outsourcing inflation and whatnot, which is something MNT, MNT or generally reject as an unfair uh, criticism. So um, we would have to go into that and lay all that down. Um, and so um, we don't have time to do that today. <laughs> may, I, may I just uh, offer one sentence here before we sign off? Mm -hmm. Okay. For the left, taking advantage of MMT's description of how the economy works is not dependent, okay, on the system's constant need for surplus value to keep itself going. I'll leave it at that. All right. Thank you. Thank you.